former president and an active member of the Society of, Society of Illustrators in New York, Dennis Dietrich has created engaging artworks for a very diverse array of clients, uh, including outdoor life, field and stream, Smithsonian, Sports Illustrated, the New York Times, and many more. He's also participated in the United States Air Force Art Program, which offers artists the opportunity to witness and record the work of the armed forces at military facilities throughout the world. He has mentored many young artists through the years and is now a professor of illustration at New Jersey City University in Jersey City, New Jersey, and at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Um, thank you so much, Dennis, for coming and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. <laughs> It's always an honor to come to the Rockwell, and uh, my life's aspiration is to maybe one day live up to Stephanie's intro, oh. you know, on the best day of my life. So, I did not make that up. I could go on for a long time. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they're pleased that you didn't. So, uh, <clears throat> folks, what I, uh, what I wanted to talk about today, there have been volumes uh, written by scholars uh, about, uh, about the use of propaganda, the philosophy behind it. Uh, we're not going to get deep into that. I just brought pictures to look at. So um, what, uh, what I thought was interesting when I started to learn about this was uh, the very different graphic treatment between what was happening with the Allied powers and the Central powers, uh, which we think of as, you know, <laughs> the U.S. and Germany, really. U.S. didn't enter the war till, uh, uh, till 1917, I believe. But um, when they knew they were getting into it, uh, you have to remember... Print was the medium of mass communication. This is what you got. You did not have television. You didn't have Wolf Blitzer on scene describing the war. Uh, this was it. Any visual information you got, you got through print. And they, uh, they were realizing at that time that the poster was the best means of uh, mass communication. And one of the things that made that work uh, was centralized population. Uh, people were walking by the same places all the time and they saw these images. Well, when, um, <clears throat> when the U.S. decided we needed uh, an organized effort for this, uh, when, when we got into it, U.S. Wa Office of War Information put together the Division of Pictorial Publicity. The Division of Pictorial Publicity was headed by, you see this guy in the middle with a bald head? That's Charles Dana Gibson. Uh, Gibson uh, created the Gibson Girl, and he was the big rock star illustrator at the time. So uh, they said, Charlie, you're in charge. Get a bunch of guys. And we see people um, who were of that era. Uh, Wallace Morgan is here. Uh, Adolf Treadler. Uh, these, were, uh, these were, again, the rock stars of the period. And they put them together, and they said, when we need, uh, when we need information delivered. Uh, you guys are in charge. Well, what do we need? Okay, we got a propaganda checklist. What do you do when you're going to run a war? We have to recruit military, boost public morale to maintain support for the war effort, raise vast amounts of money to finance the destruction, and to prevent governmental bankruptcy. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is the first mechanized war, folks. It's not romantic cavalry charges with sabers. We got tanks, we got airplanes, that stuff's expensive. So uh, promote conservation and home gardening to prevent the risk of acute shortages. And finally, to assail the enemy for his barbarism and threat to civilization. Okay, that's a lot of stuff that you have to get done with a bunch of posters, but these guys managed. By the way, I'll give a plug. Um, a, a lot of this information can be found, if you want to read more about it, uh, by somebody who was much more articulate than me. Uh, uh, the History of Graphic Design by Philip B. Meggs is a wonderful book, and I would recommend that to everyone. Um, what we're going to talk about is the very different graphic treatments uh, of what happened between the Central Powers and the Allies. Now, this one, by uh, Walter Whitehead, is very narrative. There's no two ways about it. We know what that is. Uh, and he uses a lot of the same pictorial devices that you see from the guys here, from Norman Rockwell, from Mead Schaefer. Edges are lost. Uh, details are lost. You don't need to see the buttons on his coat. 
What do we need to see? His face, his hands, a little bit of blood because he's wounded. The silhouette of this, which I like to call a Colonel Clink helmet. Um, uh, there's nothing in the background to obscure that. We see obviously what's going on. Uh, this somebody, this, this is a fighting man. He's already defeated uh, one enemy. And if you buy more Liberty Bonds, he'll get it done. Now, by contrast, this one um, by Julius Klinger uh, uh, for the Eighth War Loan. Uh, this was from a, um, a lithography shop in uh, Berlin. Uh, they had these wonderful lithography shops back then. It was, everything wasn't just you know, a, a quick print. There was a, a lot that was being done. Remember, print was a big deal. And they hired and put often under uh, exclusive contract the best designers as they could get their hands on. Now, this is a very sophisticated design. That, that would hold up today. It's, uh, it's, it's elegant. It's clean. Uh, but which one are you going to get excited about? The, exactly. Why? It's got a human because being. It's a human thing. being, action, a hero. And it could be somebody you know. Mm -hmm. It could be your father. It could be your brother. It could be your son. It could be uh, someone that, uh, that you relate to. Do you relate to a cartoon dragon? I'm thinking no. So um, they, they did this. Uh, and great. It's a, it's a nice, it would be a nice editorial image. It's the eighth war loan. There are eight arrows in the dragon. And it's reminding all the citizens that their involvement helped, you know, helped the war effort. OK, now this we're familiar with. Um, James Montgomery flag, it's probably uh, the, the most popular rec uh, recruiting poster ever. But you want to win some bar bets. Uh, with illustrators, of course. Who else is going to do this? Um, it was not created for a recruiting poster. Uh, it was a cover for Leslie's Magazine in 1916. So, you know, sucker somebody into that sometime. Uh, anyway, uh, I thought, brilliant image. Whoever, how did he think of that? Easy, he stole it. <laughs> he stole it from the Brits. Lord Kitchener. Um, and you know one of the uh, one of the uh, tools of propaganda is to uh, glorify uh, your leaders and to vilify someone else's. So this is Lord Kitchener, um, British Secretary of War, and he's doing the same thing. And there's Lord Kitchener. Uh, what a mustache, eh? The Italians, <laughs> they liked it too. And what a surprise. Anybody who would steal Poland would certainly steal an image. So uh, the, uh, the, the Germans had no problem swiping that either. Howard Chandler Christie, uh, a, lot of, a lot of you know who he is, a uh, very popular uh, illustrator of the period. And I don't think he knew how to draw men. <laughs> you know, I really don't. I mean, everything he did. You know, you want a Marine? OK, but it's going to be a girl. Uh, yeah, this, is, this is as close as you're going to get to men from Howard Chandler Christie. And uh, um, illustrators who are not used to doing type treatments, that weren't used to doing lettering, they were used to making big pictures, had to get their heads around how to integrate the, uh, uh, the type. Big surprise, Howard Chandler Christie. What does he draw? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is kind of what he did all the time. This is, you know, his peacetime work right here. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a little bit more like uh, what was uh, going on uh, with, um, with the Central Powers. Very strong flat background color and uh, one very simple, powerful image. That was kind of the nature of what they were doing. Uh, but this is, this is for us. This is for our side. And this one, <clears throat> join the Army Air Service. That's recruitment, of course. Now, uh, we're going to see another one uh, in a minute by Frank Brangwen. Uh, look, and I want you to look at the similarities between them. Look at, and this is just about the design of the whole thing. The American Eagle is the aggressor. The, the bird uh, who is losing is rocked back on his heels like a fighter that just got hit. Okay? 
and uh, the, the angular composition really evokes tension. So these guys really knew about not just how to render eagles, but they knew about design. Now, um, some of the, one of the great illustrators of the period, although this is not a great painting by him, is uh, J.C. Leyendecker. Now, Leyendecker was great for recruitment because if you joined anything that he said to join, you looked like you just came out of a steam presser. Because you know, uh, Leyendecker was one of the great um, illustrators of, uh, of fashion and glamour, and he was uh, very active later in the 20s. This is the guy that created the Arrow Collar Man. So you know about the Arrow Collar Man. But what, did you know this? The Arrow Collar Man, now, he's a painting, okay? The Arrow Collar Man got more mail-in marriage proposals than Rudy Valentino. <laughs> now, think about that. If you're Rudy Valentino, <laughs> you know, and you're thinking, I came in second to a painting? Yeah, you did. So, um, so here's, uh, so here's Leindecker telling us all that, yeah, the Navy's a great life because your creases never fade. As hokey as something like this is by today's standards, back then, same thing that you said before, we're going to relate. This is a guy reaching into his coveralls. Here, let us get it done. You guys are in the field. You guys are fighting. Um, we'll pony up and buy some more bonds. And this one was for uh, productivity. Uh, you're, you're in the coal mine. You're in a steel mill. You're somewhere working. But if, uh, if you look at this, the guy with the pickaxe is just as important as the guy with the Browning automatic rifle. Okay, you're, you, they're equating his contribution with his. Mm -hmm. This guy's mining coal, this guy is behind concertina wire. This one for home and country, victory, liberty, alone. This guy just got home, how do we know that? He's not leaving, he just got back, how do we know? His child is hugging him. Well, yeah, the child would probably hug him when he leaves too. Yeah. Uh, what else? No, he's got a happy look on his yeah. face. Yeah, exactly. He's got a decoration. Looks like a distinguished service cross. Okay? No, but they, look, they all look happy. If he were leaving, they'd be sad. You're right. Mm -hmm. He has a helmet, too. War trophy. Yep. Okay, so devices like that, just to show you, you know, are, is this an arrival or a departure? Yeah, you guys are right. And this, by remember, okay, remember the birds a minute ago? Okay, you see that? You see the similarity between the, the, the dynamic, the angular um, composition, the aggressor is leaning forward, this guy's rocking back on his heels. Uh, that reads as a silhouette, okay? You see the, um, the very stark white background, so none of this action really gets lost. Okay, that was by Frank Brangwen. Frank Brangwen was one of... Um, the, the great muralist in, uh, in the UK. As a matter of fact, um, uh, some of our own guys, Dean Cornwell. We know about Dean Cornwell? You know about Dean Cornwell. Something tells me you know Dean Cornwell. Okay, Dean Cornwell was America's greatest muralist. Uh, I get to say that because I got the slides. So um, he, was, uh, you know, he was fantastic, but at the height of his career, and this is just an aside, folks, uh, at the, at the very height of his career, the height of his popularity, he's a rock star at that time, he put his career on hold for a year, and he went to England to study mural painting with Brangwen. That's how good this guy was. This was, uh, this is J.C. Leindecker again, and this was uh, to honor the Boy Scouts of America for being involved with the uh, um, war bond drive. And uh, Leindecker again, uh, this is uh, an instructional piece order coal now. They didn't want any shortages, they wanted to be able to plan. And again, Leindecker. I come from a steel town, folks. Nobody looks like that. <laughs> but everybody he did looked handsome and heroic. Not just the arrow collar guy, but if you're a coal miner and Leindecker drew you, you looked like uh, a movie star. And once you have an image like that, don't waste it. <laughs> Let's keep using that thing. Yeah. And here's a, a post cover by Lion Decker, the Santa Claus. That's, this is stuff he did in peacetime. And also peacetime, Kuppenheimer clothes. He was, um, Lion Decker was uh, 
was the guy that did the great Gatsby kind of stuff. He did these beautiful high fashion things. And if you, the other side of the coin, if you ever want to look it up, is John Held Jr. and Russell Patterson. And those guys did the college humor, the same time, you know, 20s, uh, did college humor, goldfish swallowing, raccoon coat wearing, flapper era, okay? He's not doing that. So they were, one, one worked one side of the street and one worked the other. And this is, you can't get simpler than this. It's James Montgomery Flagg. He's the guy that gave us Uncle Sam, remember? That he swiped from Lord Kitchener. Um, the, and very simple, very direct, nothing in the background, uh, painfully obvious headline here. And the tagline is brute simple. Tell that to the Marines. Okay, and enlistment. If we can't if we can't charm you into this by conning you into thinking you're going to look like a sailor made by Leyendecker, uh, we're going to shame you into it. Because here's this guy who looks like Lord Fauntleroy grown up, and his shoulders are about the same width as his lapels. So um, he's looking out the window at all these brave guys marching off to war, and that was just uh, another tactic. Um, but reads as a silhouette, lit from the back, and this wonderful graphic symbol, um, the, the US flag, uh, blowing across the front of it. And this we've seen before. Um, remember that part about vilifying the enemy? Okay, I don't know how much farther you can go than this. Destroy the mad brute. This is, um, uh, this is, uh, this is the Central Powers with the German Culture Club uh, uh, crossing, uh, crossing the Atlantic. Yeah, that's, that's, pretty, yeah, that's pretty simple, pretty plain. And the other thing that makes some things like this work is if your propaganda message is not diluted by someone else's, it's going to be that much more effective. So if this is everywhere, we're going to get scared, we're going to get nervous, we're going to support the, uh, the war effort. Okay, so this last one was for recruitment and list. And this one, beat back the Hun with Liberty Bonds. We don't want this guy coming over the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So if we buy enough war bonds, maybe we can keep Frankenstein in his cage. And this is just to make you angry. Remember Belgium, what's going on? Okay, does she look like she really wants to, you know, wants to go this way? Um, yeah, probably not. Yeah, he's dragging her, right? And we know what he is. He looks like Schultz from Hogan's Heroes. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got this spiky thing. We've got this mustache that you could sweep a sidewalk with. And uh, Belgium is in, uh, is in ruins, is in flames. And here he is dragging off a young girl. Now, if that doesn't make you mad, what will? I'm going to buy a Liberty, bo Liberty Bond, so maybe somebody <laughs> will deal with this guy. Uh, this is done by Harvey Dunn. Harvey Dunn, uh, a very famous artist, student of Howard Pyle. Harvey Dunn was actually commissioned a captain in the American Expeditionary Force, and uh, in uniform and everything. And he was in France, in the trenches, making sketches. And he made a lot of paintings. Again, this is an aside. This is not about propaganda. But he made a lot of paintings that um, really disappointed the War Department. Well, how come? They didn't look heroic. They didn't look like clean soldiers. It was an accurate record. Did you see some of these? Um, it was an accurate record of what was actually going on. And it was, man, war looks like a mess. There is mud, for God's sake. Uh, and, and so they, you know, of course, by the time he got them done, we're out of the war. It's pretty much over with. So these things get put in an Indiana Jones basement somewhere, and they're not seen for years and later became uh, acknowledged as the best visual record of what happened during World War I. But they, they wanted them for propaganda and they couldn't use them because it didn't support this great idea of marching off in clean campaign hats. Uh, but here he is doing a poster. Uh, very nicely designed, beautifully painted, uh, send wheat. He did this kind of stuff uh, for American Legion magazine. He was all over the place with it. But a very popular uh, illustrator and teacher of the period. More of a flat graphic treatment, but um, this is that part about don't waste food, conserve things. 
one of the ways uh, to, um, to lampoon uh, your enemy was to make him look stupid. Not the best gag in the world. You know, okay, uh, really a stretch. It's like you must have thought of this on Friday afternoon. And uh, an effective caricature just the same. Send books for comfort. And here's Jesse Wilcox Smith. Jesse Wilcox Smith, um, student of Howard Pyle, as Harvey Dunn was, but you're not going to call Jesse Wilcox Smith for the same stuff you call Harvey Dunn for. Okay, if you are doing something like a cream of wheat ad, if you're doing Campbell's Soup, something like that, you're going to call Jesse Wilcox Smith. She made a fortune. They called her the mint. Uh, Jesse Wilcox Smith, Violet Oakley, Elizabeth Shippen Green, uh, they were very popular at the time, but this is what they did. So do you have a Red Cross service flag? Are you supporting the war effort? And this is from a very different perspective than, you know, come on, I got a bayonet. From Britain, but it looks a lot like what the Central Powers were doing in that it's a flat graphic treatment and they're using symbols rather than narrative art. Allies use stuff that we were using in the magazines that people were used to seeing all the time and that was going to relate. So now let's look at what the other side did. Here come the central powers. This is the kind of stuff, this is not a war piece, this is an ad for a light bulb, but uh, I show this because of the design. It's an elegant design. It's beautifully done. That would hold up today. You could, you, know, you might want to buy that poster and hang it up in your, uh, in your home just because it's a beautiful piece of graphic art. There's the eighth war loan. We saw that before. And this is a poster for, uh, the other thing was to show that the enemy is vulnerable. Uh, this was a poster to promote uh, the exhibition of captured aircraft. So we have the Eagle sitting on top of the British roundel, uh, which is, uh, a, whether you used a flag, whether you used a symbol, anything that, uh, that you could damage. And this is obviously shot full of holes. This is a, um, a strange one. Um, I, I always thought it was uh, a, a very medieval Germanic kind of, a, a kind of a treatment. And I even forgot what that said. I had somebody translate. Does somebody want to read this for me? It's referring to the iron fist, the armored yeah. fist, which isn't named but shown. But that is the way to peace. Uh, the enemy wanted like that way, therefore subscribe to the war loan. Hans Rudi Ernt, another uh, very, uh, very popular artist, uh, the brilliant design here, I think. Uh, they, they figured out, the Germans figured out that the only way to uh, break the British blockade was through the U-boat campaign. And to glorify what the U-boats did, that was intended to rally the, uh, the rest of the country behind them. I had this translated, I forgot what it said. Can you, can you read that one? Let's see. Uh, the greater the effort, uh, the sooner a good peace. And the, up the top is the uh, eighth uh, war loan. Okay. This is an artist that kind of bridged the two. The German uh, clock of steel, poster style, uh, was uh, the stuff that Julius Klinger was doing was kind of kind of both sides of that that coin you know he he used he used tonal of uh, a more tonal approach it was a, obviously a very effective silhouette but he used a tonal approach also the german war saucepan basically it is a souvenir uh, sign of the german housewife mm -hmm. yeah it was to uh, to honor their effort in the in the war right you know, and it's, it's, I think it's a beautiful design, but does it speak to you on any kind of a visceral level? Eh, probably not. It's, you know, it's a stylized flaming skillet. Over in Britain, we're, uh, we're telling you to, um, to save bread, otherwise a U-boat might come through the window. <laughs> Another piece for the war loan. Glow, holy flame, glow, and uh, never go out for the... Uh, fatherland this is the day of sacrifice and we see this again now I, I bring it up again just uh, to ask after we've seen all these what side do you think is more effective 
This is your grandma. Now remember, this is, these are Victorian times, folks. This is your grandma asking you to support the Liberty Loan. Okay? Now, what do you think speaks to you more? Grandma, of course. Grandma or a fla flaming skillet? How about this one? You know, what do you relate to? You relate to that. Of course you do. You know, you want to take off your shirt and you want to hit somebody. No wonder we won. Of course! <laughs> it's all about illustration. That's what's cool. <laughs> what did we learn today? <laughs> J. Allen St. John was a very popular pulp artist. Uh, the pulp magazines of the 30s. And uh, this is uh, one of his Bond posters. We're not, gonna, we're, we're not gonna spend any time on World War II, but it's kinda like I told you that to tell you this. Um, this was not lost on Hitler. Okay, now this is one of ours. Keep mum, she's not so dumb. Don't talk. Uh, careless talk got there first. This is what can happen if you blab. What we failed to do in propaganda was done by the enemy with great skill and ingenious deliberation. The lesson wasn't lost on him. So, uh, so look what his stuff looks like now. He turned Goebbels loose and said, you, you see this? Make that. Give me what they did. And it was, uh, it was much more effective. Not effective enough. This is going to speak to everybody. This, um, this plaque of steel was influenced by modern art, was influenced by cubism, was influenced by the Vienna succession. Um, this wasn't. And I always like this one uh, by uh, uh, Ludwig Holwein. He's the guy that did the helmet with the very tonal uh, character behind it. A good drawing, it's a good drawing. Let's use it for America's Meat Roundup. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this right after uh, Pearl Harbor, remember December 7th. So um, with, uh, with all that went on between uh, the uh, Central Powers and the Allies uh, and the lesson that was, uh, that was picked up by Hitler in the Second World War, we perhaps inadvertently taught him everything he knew. But we didn't teach him everything we knew. We got it done. Thank you, folks. Thank <laughs> you.